In today's video, we are talking about PIRAD, so prostate imaging reporting and data systems. So what this is, is they basically, it's a grading system for prostate MRIs. But today we're gonna to talk about does the size or the number on the PIRAD system correlate to how aggressive prostate cancer can be. We're gonna talk about the ins and outs and making sure that if you do get a higher score on a PIRAD system, what to do and what the next sequence is. Today, Dr. Scholz, we are talking about PIRADs and we're talking about MRIs. So let's just talk about the basics and kind of describe where the you know term PIRADs and all of this comes into play. Um, when it comes to an MRI, we're talking specifically about prostate MRIs, and then we're talking about PIRADs being a grading system. And so what is a PIRADs? It's kind of like a weird word for those who are new to this vocabulary. Yeah, it's a way to quantify an abnormality seen on an MRI. If you see a, a lesion, a shadow, a spot, a bump, is it cancer? Even more importantly, is it a, a relevant type of cancer? We know there's a lot of cancers in the prostate that don't spread and we really don't even need to know about them. Uh, knowing about them doesn't help anybody. But there are other types of prostate cancers that can potentially spread and those are the ones we want to detect. When Men undergo a multiparametric MRI, usually with three Tesla technology. Images are acquired through a, the imaging experience where you go into the tube and take carefully orchestrated pictures. And then those images are then later read by a uh, trained radiologist, hopefully trained in reading prostate MRIs because it's quite tricky to read these MRIs. When they see a spot or shadow, we call them lesions, on the MRI, they grade them from one to five. The fives and the fours being the consequential variants, the ones and the twos you can ignore, and the threes, the doctor is sort of equivocating and saying, eh, maybe there's something there, maybe not. This uh, grading system then clues people in who are reading the report later as to whether or not what they're seeing might need further action, such as a biopsy. One of the things with these MRIs is the fact that we have these lesions popping up and then people want to know if they're cancer. So how would you go about that? Uh, there's two approaches. One is to do a targeted biopsy where a needle is stuck into the lesion itself. And then the cells that are removed with the needle are then looked at under a microscope and it's graded, uh, so-called Gleason grading. Indirectly, you can also use a PSMA PET scan to detect the presence or absence of cancer because if the PET scan lights up in the same area as the abnormal lesion is on the MRI, that confirms that it is prostate cancer. What a PSMA PET scan does not do is tell you what the grade is. Before I get to our next question, I just wanted to remind you to click the subscribe button below this video. It's a great way to support our channel and all the work we do at PCRI. Another way to support is you can do it financially at pcri.org forward slash donate. Also, I just wanted to remind you that we do have an in-person conference coming up in September and you can learn more at pcri.org forward slash conference. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. So there's a couple of things you mentioned even in that. It's the fact that you said targeted biopsy, so we want to let people know there's a difference between random needle biopsies and targeted biopsies. Random needle biopsies being typically between 12 to 14 cores and it's like on a grid pattern versus targeted biopsies where they're using this imaging to specifically tape a couple of cores from that tumor. Now, is it possible that in the process, does the PSMA tell you anything about the PIRADs or is it specifically the MRI? Right, there has been talk about being able to sense how aggressive a cancer is going to be based on the PIRADs number, the fours and the fives, being more likely to be types of prostate cancer, uh, Gleason 7 or above, types that could potentially spread. But the PIRADs system is nowhere near as precise as a Gleason score is. So uh, you can get some sort of a sense or a guesstimate or uh, probability of a higher Gleason score by looking at the PIRADs 4 and the PIRADs 5 labeled lesions. But the PIRADs system is nowhere near accurate enough to tell patients in advance of a biopsy what the Gleason score is going to be. One of the things about this, and it comes to PIRADS, is that when somebody is in an emotional state and they're learning, oh, I have a PIRADS 4 or 5 and it can be really scary, there's another system, as you've talked about, with these biopsies called Gleason scores, and now we know that Gleason 6, which is 3 plus 3, does not metastasize 100% of the time. So if you have Gleason 6 prostate cancer, there's even a lot of talk in the medical community about not talking and not calling it prostate cancer. However, it makes me think, can Gleason 6 prostate cancer have a PIRAD size of four and five? It indeed 
certainly can. And uh, that is the reason that people have to go beyond just the MRI to get some uh, precision as to what's really going on. And you can have pyreds four and five uh, abnormalities detected on an MRI, which isn't cancer at all, where it's just an area of inflammation that got misread. So the methodology to assign these numbers, the pyreds, to these different shadows or lesions as we've been calling them, uh, is helpful in terms of finding cancers. It's helpful in terms of directing where targeted biopsies need to go uh, to find out with more detail what it really is, but it is not perfect. And a good percentage of pyreds four and five lesions will turn out to not be cancer at all. So one of the things that we talk about often is second opinions, and it's not just second opinions when we think about seeing another doctor and getting their opinion. We talk about it in MRIs, we talk about it in PET scans, we talk about it in biopsy results. And so when it comes to an MRI, these are very um, intricate systems that they're using. You know, the PIRAD system is a grading system off of size, but the type of, you know, magnets that they're using, is it a 1.5, is it a 3 Tesla? You know, what type of fusions are they using? To What type of technology are they at the latest and greatest? So you can get second opinions on MRI results, and even the difference between the image itself and then the person reading it, there can be vast um, differences. So do you encourage all your patients to get a second opinion on MRI? Is it based off facilities? Like, how does that work? I think it's important if people are going to get a prostate MRI to ascertain what the volume of MRI imaging is done at that facility. And if the volume is low, that could indicate that the experience with reading the MRIs is limited. And there is a unfortunate tendency for doctors who don't do this a lot to overread, to sort of cover their asses to make sure that it, they're not missing anything. And the more experienced doctors who look at hundreds and hundreds of these uh, recognize patterns and they know what to call and what to bypass and say this is irrelevant. And that's very important because if uh, doctors are overemphasizing little shot, shadows and spots, this is going to lead to a lot of unnecessary biopsies. If someone has a multiparametric MRI done at a facility where they're not doing a large volume, it isn't that difficult to get the images on a disc and send them to a, a reference university that does large volume MRI reading and determine if they will confirm the original reading. We order a lot of MRI overreads in our practice. We use a lot of MRI in our daily practice. The incidence of a change in the readout going from some outside, less known facility to a, a reference university facility is very significant. I would argue as much as half the time we'll see a change in the readout. And this is partly because we can look at a report and determine the skill of the reader just by the systematic way that the report is laid out. And if there's missing information because the outside reader has not done a lot of these or doesn't know the system that well, uh, you can detect that oftentimes in looking at the report, and that is a clue that this should be overread at a reference center. So we talked about if Gleason 6 has, you know, you can have a, a Pyrads 4 or 5, a large uh, volume tumor with Gleason 6. I would imagine it's the same with every other type of Gleason score as well when we talk about 7s, 8s, and 9s, and 10s. Um, you know, it, can it, do you commonly see that these Gleason scores also can have, you know, um, just go up in those PIRAD scores? There is a rough correlation between higher Gleason scores and higher PIRAD scores. There's also a correlation between higher PIRAD scores, again, level four and level five, with it being some form of consequential cancer versus not being cancer at all or being a low-grade cancer. But the correlation is not tight enough to where you can say, well, it's a pyreds 5, therefore I know it's a high-grade cancer and I don't even need a biopsy. That uh, would be a, an unfair extrapolation. The actual sampling of the tissue is what finally determines whether what was seen on the MRI is a consequential a type of cancer or an inconsequential type. And even in that situation, right, we want to get a second opinion with those biopsy results because I heard even from physicians at the conference that in 30% of cases, the, the Gleason score itself can change and be either upgraded or downgraded. Right, well, if you think about it, it's rather quite an art form for people to look at scattered cells under a microscope and then be able to predict 
that one form of prostate cancer it has a greater risk of spreading someday compared to another grouping of cells that uh, they judge, their expert opinion is that their risk of future spread is quite a bit lower or maybe even non-existent. And what an important determination that is. Like so many things in the medical world, the doctors, the pathologists who are reading these things are reading out uh, and looking at cells of hundreds of different things, different types of cancers, and, and making all kinds of determinations. And prostate cancer is not their full-time job. So the idea that doctors who are doing this full-time are going to be more precise and experienced and make more accurate distinctions is hardly surprising. But uh, when people get a biopsy report, they may not know what the background is of the doctor who's reading this. And getting those glass slides that were created at the time of the biopsy can be then mailed to a world-class center. An overread can be obtained of the biopsy to confirm that the Gleason score is accurate. Now, one of the biggest things when it comes to being diagnosed with cancer in general is the fear that comes with it. And when it comes to prostate cancer, I know for men it deals with sexuality and so much intimacy and so many things in their own personal lives. And so one of the things we like to talk about is that if you do have a larger pyrad size, the most important thing in prostate cancer is what is the risk of it metastasizing? And we wanna know from that biopsy result, you know, what is your risk? And this is what we're paying attention to and why you're double checking imaging and why you're double checking the pathology of it. But if you naturally see that there's a, a four or a five um, grade, you know, pyrad on an MRI and on a prostate, does that give you more concern for metastasis because of the size of the tumor? Yeah, and pyrads is not just size. It's also, they can look at diffusion weighted imaging, other factors that suggest aggressiveness, uh, size being one of the factors. Predicting the risk of future metastasis without a biopsy will certainly to some degree be based on the size of the lesion. Little tiny lesions, you know, MRIs can detect things down to five millimeters and, and you can have a chunk of cancer that's, you know, a couple inches across in a prostate looking at the extremes. So certainly the much smaller lesions are less likely to spread. It's not as powerful a predictor as you might think, though, because a lot of prostate cancers, despite the fact that they can grow and grow and grow, don't spread. When you're looking at something larger, you may not be looking at something that's necessarily more aggressive. You may just be looking at something that's been there a long time and has had a lot of time to grow. Now, are tumors more likely to grow on one side of the prostate than the other? No, they can pretty much show up on either side. But if you ask the question, what about tumors in the front or the back of the prostate, yes, there is a marked discrepancy. The peripheral zone at the back of the prostate is about uh, constitutes about 90% of prostate cancers in that region, and only about 10% occur in the front, which is a good thing from an imaging point of view because it's easier to ascertain spots in the back of the prostate due to the background. The front of the prostate tends to be um, sort of heterogeneous and there's the, you can have BPH nodules and other things that might mimic cancers, um, whereas the peripheral zone, the back of the prostate, where 90% of the cancers occur, it tends to be more homogeneous and tumors light up a little bit uh, more easily in the uh, imaging process. So we've talked about a lot of different terms and grading systems and things like that, but let's talk about the sequencing of them. So. We're talking about getting imaging first, like an MRI, before you get hopefully a targeted biopsy versus a random needle biopsy. So we know that that um, imaging comes first and then you get the pyrads, but would you get a second opinion on the MRI before you would go straight to a PET scan, before you would go to get any pathology done? Um, in your, if there was like a perfect Dr. Scholl's sequence, what would that be? It would be attractive if someone has a, a high PSA to get an MRI, if they see a spot, to get a PET scan, uh, to see if the spot lights up. If the spot doesn't light up, you're about 90% certain that it's not prostate cancer. So there may be some people then who, with low PSAs or maybe more advanced age that say, I'm not even going to bother with a biopsy. But the problem is that insurance typically will not cover a PSMA PET scan unless you have already had a biopsy and there's confirmation of existing prostate cancer, after which, yes, PSMA PET scans are covered. So the usual sequence would be to get your PSA checked. If it's elevated, get an MRI. If the MRI shows a pyrets four or five lesion, some people would say even a pyrets three lesion, consider getting a targeted biopsy to see if it's a consequential variant of prostate cancer. We've talked greatly about, you know, four and five pyrad uh, scores, but talking about the threes and even taking care of those in their own section, I do have a question. So 
When it comes to a three, is that automatically that you would get a targeted biopsy or is there a time where you say, well, it's not really showing a lot, it's a three, like let's go ahead and get a second opinion on the MRI before we do a targeted biopsy? If a expert center says there's a pyrans three lesion and you send all those people for targeted biopsies, about one in five will have some sort of prostate cancer that you would want to consider treating. You can present that statistic to the patient. If they want to proceed on with a targeted biopsy, that's very reasonable. Many centers wouldn't even make it an option. Let's say you had a pyreds 3 lesion, you must have a biopsy. The other alternative would be to get another MRI in a year and do sort of an active surveillance type approach. And if the lesion just sits there and doesn't change, the PSA is stable, can you just go year to year watching this pyreds 3 lesion since the vast majority of them aren't prostate cancers? So there's no formal agreement or broad spread consensus about the right way to handle PIREDS-3. Different centers handle it different ways. And just to confirm, you know, one of the things about prostate cancer and, you know, men checking their PSA every year, and we encourage this as part of that screening process, but if we have a patient who, you know, they do have a PIREDS-1 or 2, they should get annual MRIs to make sure that they are checking it. They're making sure, is it developing, is it growing, what's going on there? It doesn't mean naturally you have to go to a biopsy, but it is important to continue to monitor monitor those and not just say, well, it's a one or a two, it's not anything significant, and therefore we're going to ignore it. I think a lot of times with, with patients, sometimes we tell them, oh, this is great news, like it's not, you know, something you need to pay attention to right now, but it also isn't something to ignore. So getting those MRIs annually, making sure you're checking your PSA is very important in those instances. As I was talking to Dr. Scholz, one of the things that came to my mind is how important it is to optimize care. And when we talk about optimizing care, it means that even if you're in a standard medical system, if you have the knowledge of what the latest and greatest way of monitoring is, it's important to apply that. So if you do get a one or a two, and you know maybe a doctor says, oh, it's nothing to worry about, and you don't get a lot of information, you still should follow up and make sure that you're monitoring your PSA, and you are following up and getting another MRI in a year so that you you can track that and it's just a good way to know what your prostate's doing the activity in it and make sure that nothing is progressing without your knowledge it's also important to work with your care team that if there is something significant whether it's a three a four or a five to work to get a targeted biopsy versus a random needle biopsy this just to help helps eliminate risk of infection a lot of issues even physical pain and so it's just a great way to pursue top quality care now, if you do get findings that you're concerned about and you want to make sure to double check, large universities have big MRI prostate programs. We talk about UCLA, we talk about John Hopkins, Memorial Sloan Kettering. There's all sorts of universities that I haven't even mentioned, but you can do your research, whether that's on Google or maybe an AI uh, bot or model can help you like ChatGPT or Grok or Gemini. But these are really great way to find out what's closest to you. What are the pricing? And is it worth you know paying a couple extra dollars, hundred dollars in order to make sure that you are knowing exactly what's going on, that a professional and somebody who's really experienced in reading these MRIs is looking at it. And then again, if you do get a biopsy, you want to make sure in the targeted biopsy that you're getting that reread as well. I have many personal friends who have prostate cancer and were told that they had higher um, you know, Gleason scores than in reality when they got it checked again. And then I've had the opposite where they were told that they had a lower when it was really in reality, a higher situation. These are things that you want to double check so that you can make sure to have precision medicine for your type of prostate cancer. All of this is leading up to the point that if you have to choose treatment, you have the most accurate information to work off of because you don't wanna be undertreated, but you also don't want to be overtreated. If you would like more information about anything that we talked about today, PCRI.org, it is our website. We have a lot of information, and we also have PCRI.org forward slash helpline available. You can fill out the form there, and one of our prostate cancer patients who's been trained by the medical oncology team can help answer your questions either by phone or by email. It's a great way to get information, not advice, but it is really good just to talk to your doctor about your specific case, and helpline's a really great way to help get you ready for those appointments. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel because we come out with new videos every week. And please remember, most of all, you're not alone.